might make, and maybe not an improvement, is that you know, if to involve people at the deepest level, I think what deepest level means, like right down to your bone, right? I mean, we're talking about emotion. Stories connect us emotionally. Um, that's why we remember uh, fondly uh, about things. So that word emotion in mathematics generally has been associated with anxiety or trauma, uh, negative experiences. But what does a positive emotional memory of mathematics maybe look like? So we'll get to that uh, later in the keynote. But I really like this quote to just really give the macro idea uh, of storytelling. And uh, you know, when I was writing my second book, uh, storytelling actually became uh, a fixture in the center of the book. And uh, uh, we chose this uh, quote by Sumon Kidd, which I absolutely love. Um, it's really, it gets right to the core in terms of you know, when we stop telling stories. You know, and especially stories of people, places, and things which many, uh, some of us uh, don't know or have forgotten. And there's a lot of those kinds of stories in mathematics. So storytelling three years ago was a chapter in a book, but I think now in late 2020 and 2021, and uh, I think it's going to be an emergent theme for something bigger and involve as many people as possible. We can read about stories. But the stories that I tell you today is going to come through my voice. I mean, the power of voice, uh, the modulations, the inflections, the pauses, the, you know, the exaggerated voice sometimes, uh, the repetition of an idea. You can't duplicate that in writing. And that's why I think it's easier, even though emotionally it's harder to get a story out through voice. I think that's the most accessible way for anyone to have their stories heard. Um, to be read, it's hard because writing is maybe a difficult task for some people, but I think to, for to speak, the voice, I think there's a lot of power in that. So just to, at the beginning, I just want to set the tone of how important stories are and think about stories just in your own life that have been impactful for you or stories that maybe you have said too. But I want to start with stories which maybe you don't know. Stories which have nothing to do with mathematics. Is there any sort of common link? Is there any sort of, why did these stories become so powerful? I love this image. This is like uh, early 1960s. And I want to tell a story which has been told. I mean, it's, it's a pretty big story now. A documentary was made about it and I'll show you that in a couple of slides. But if I asked you the question, who is the storyteller here? Um, you would either say, you could say the person on the left, it looks like he's the one who's speaking. That's uh, the blues artist, Mance Lipscomb. And the person listening on the right is uh, Chris Strachwitz. But in fact, they're actually both storytellers. But in this particular case, you need someone who is telling the story. You need someone who is an attentive listener. I want you to remember that part, the attentive part, the attention part. There's, there's a very powerful quote about that. So who, who is, uh, who are these people? I'm gonna fast forward about, uh, you know, that's 1960s. So, you know, we're gonna go close to 50 odd years. This is Chris in his uh, record store in uh, San Francisco. And he's the founder of Art Hulu Records. And if you look at the, uh, on your right hand side, there's about a hundred thumbnails of records. Uh, about 16 of them are covered up by the center uh, circle. And I, if you're looking at them, you're maybe squinting, and, but I don't think you recognize a lot of those artists. You see what Chris did for almost his entire life from starting in the late 50s. He's cataloged all these wonderful artists of America that you would find you know, uh, in the sort of the, the kitchens, the backyards, in rural areas. Um, whether it's uh, blues, bluegrass, gospel, jazz, uh, Appalachian music, uh, Zydeco. He has captured the heart and soul of America of artists which may not have been heard. And he's collected and he created a label for that. He has given a platform for all these stories. And when you have something that powerful, somebody wants to tell your story 
So here we have, and I actually met these two beautiful women, uh, Chris Simon and Maureen Gosling back in Toronto in 2013 when the film, This Ain't No Mouse Music, a documentary paying homage to Chris Strachwitz, who's still alive. And if it wasn't for Chris, and if it wasn't for Maureen and Chris Simon, we wouldn't know about the artists like Big Mama Thornton, Mance Lipscomb. We wouldn't get access to these pictures, these slices, these vignettes of, you know, time gone. Their stories did get told. And that's pretty powerful. It's a, always a bit of a challenge for me to get through the next couple of slides because I met Anthony Bourdain back in 2005 and uh, at a book signing. And uh, he was just as gracious as, you know, all the stuff that's out there. And I was a three minute interaction, but look at this picture and look at the, remember the first slide I showed you between Mance Lipscomb and Chris Strachwitz. Look at what's happening here between the Senegalese woman and uh, Anthony Bourdain. She is giving him the gift of her story in return. And this is a beautiful quote by uh, Simone Vale, who is a sister of, uh, was a sister of uh, Anton Vale, um, who was one, a French mathematician, Andre Vale, sorry. Uh, I think I get that mixed up sometimes. Uh, he was one of the great French, French mathematicians of the Bourbaki group in the late 30s. Uh, and she has this wonderful quote that says, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. So what you're giving me all now for the next you know, uh, 50 minutes or so, you're giving me your attention. You're giving me the purest and rarest form of generosity. And that's the, also the impact of storytelling. It's not just, it's this, it's a two way street. There's a wonderful story to be told, but there's a person who's listening to the story and who, it doesn't stop there because those stories get passed on as we had seen. And I love this image and I love this quote. How did Anthony Bourdain, you know, the dishwasher in the seventies, New York restaurants, didn't think he was gonna make much in the world, actually had a very poor self image of himself. And he ends up on this boat in the Mekong Delta. And that quote can apply to us as well. You can just take a, as a cook, how about as a math educator, as a math teacher, what are your memories? Maybe math problems, maybe your students uh, lessons in that. And are you in search of new ones? So are you gonna leave your classroom? Uh, at least, uh, maybe figuratively, but metaphorically at least. And are you gonna have you know, new epiphanies? Will you try anything? Will you risk everything? We as math educators need to be on that boat in the Mekong Delta. You know, sleeves rolled up, humbled, and having those human connections. But stories go for that for much further than Anthony Bourdain or uh, Chris Strachwitz. You know, they go right back to the beginning, you know, of humans, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes. And these two articles actually came out within weeks of each other in 2017. And uh, stories are, they, they can galvanize whole tribes. They pass on lessons and mores that or help make that tribe survive. I'm gonna tell you a very short story. It takes about 30 seconds. And this is a, a story that's given by the Agta people, the hunter-gatherer culture uh, in the Philippines. And it's a story about a, a wild pig and a sea cow. And they used to race every single day until the sea cow hurt its legs. And the wild pig carried it to the water, to the sea, to the ocean. And they continued to race the wild pig on land and the sea cow in the water. 30 seconds, that story conveys friendship. That story conveys cooperation, empathy, and an aversion to inequality. So stories in general are so powerful. 
And, you know, I'd be remiss not to share this quote by the great Maya Angelou, which we're all familiar with. There's so many stories that I, you know, I almost agonize are inside of me, uh, just not math stories, but just stories of myself or just things you want to get out. And I think it's important that we are given uh, platforms and spaces to do this. So what is storytelling in mathematics, right? What is storytelling in mathematics? I mean, on the left-hand side, you definitely got that idea that, you know, can be used for, you know, memory aids, instruction manuals. I mean, that's, that's like the bare minimum. But if you look at the, the picture of the Borromean rings, and if you know anything about the Borromean rings, if you take one ring out, the other two rings fall apart. So the story of mathematics, the story of you, the story of your students, you can tell any of those kinds of stories, but they're all linked. That's what makes the whole story of everything we're talking about so powerful because they're all linked together. And I'm sure we can share stories about either one of those things, ourselves, our journeys as educators, the stories of our students that only we know, but we would like to share with the world, and any stories of mathematics which are you know, relevant to us. But <laughs> to start with, what does instruction, what does math look like when there's no stories? When there's none. Integers, these are like pretty common worksheets we've seen. Uh, maybe you'd see some sort of semblance of these in even textbooks, right? Adding integers. I've, you know, uh, I'm sure uh, we've given these out, uh, our students, our daughters and sons have had them, but there's no history here. But what does it look like when you start to try to put in some sort of narrative? So here's an introduction and it's got some sort of whimsical image of sort of numbers and, you know, and it's trying to tell a story or trying to connect students, but still the story of integers isn't there. And that is disheartening because they have such a wild ride of a story. It's not until the 19th century did, was there any resolution for the acceptance of negative numbers. And think about it, hundreds and hundreds of years of not knowing how to handle these negative numbers. And don't think for one second that that does not maybe impact how our own students learn about negative numbers. Maybe their the historical confusion about them, the historical angst still carries on with our students. So I'm gonna go right into the weeds. I'm gonna, we're actually gonna do some math. Uh, you know, uh, I love sort of talking about macro ideas drilling down to micro things in the classroom and then pulling back out. So uh, Jonathan Crabtree, who I uh, spoke at, uh, I think yesterday, he's the one who's been responsible for giving a lots of information about Brahmagupta, who basically gave us all the laws of zero in 620 uh, current era. It was all given. But the, the whole transmission, the translation from East to Middle East to the West, zero is only taken as a placeholder. And that is one reason why integers, right, positive numbers are maybe taught in grade one and negative numbers are taught, like my own daughter is learning in seventh grade. They should be taught side by side. And I can give you proof in this blank screen, which is zero temporarily. How about this question? Two subtract negative five. Now we teach our students two minuses make a plus, or maybe there's some number line element involved. Maybe there's some directional qualities. But if you involve history, and if you involve some sort of intuition, this is what you get. Brahma Gupta suggested we add zero, and you're thinking, okay, that doesn't change the question exactly. It doesn't change it. And we always sort of emphasize the idea of zero pairs at some point in middle school, because two 
I don't have any, think of uh, minus five as objects. I don't have any of those minus fives, nothing. Well, how about you introduce some, but with the zero pairing? Okay, let me get a whole bunch of minus fives or whatever kind of language you wanna use. But as long as you have an add five plus five, you're okay. And I think some of you see where this is gonna go. So now, if you just look at the left-hand side, minus five, subtract minus five, same object, subtract same object, same quantity, subtract same quantity, you're gonna get zero. That's one of the you know, laws of zero. And then you're left with, again, that green zero, two plus five, it's seven. Is it long-winded? Yes, it is. But if we wanna weave in factual, conceptual, and procedural fluencies, Math history allows us to do that. And you can even do it in that whole storytelling, weave in Brahma Gupta, the laws of zero. This is why we're doing it. Have those aha moments with students. Here's another classic example, Pythagorean theorem. I've seen so many times the right angle triangle is thrown on the board, A, B, and C, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's, that's the proof, we're done. Are we, now we're just asking students to plug in numbers and check. And maybe solve for B, which has a little bit of, you know, a little bit of algebraic twist. But for the most part, like it's done. Shouldn't students be uh, uh, learn about the history and maybe construct some proofs? Like Pythagorean theorem is so rich. There's the idea that the Chinese definitely knew it around the same time, if not before, as the Greeks, Pythagoras. There's 367 different proofs of it. If you Google the bride's chair, you're going to get one of the proofs. Uh, there was a sort of tongue in cheek nod in The Simpsons, uh, which have you know four or five uh, writers who have Harvard math uh, and or science degrees, and they did a sort of a nod to like you know Fermat's last theorem with the exponent 12. By the way, that's called a Fermat near miss. If you actually put those uh, numbers in the calculator, um, because of how big they are the first nine or 10 digits will be correct. So these are called Fermat near misses. This isn't just like, okay, the exponent can't be 12. It can't be, but because the base is so big, um, you know, uh, the actually the calculator in terms of how many digits, it will actually prove left side equals right side. And you've got this dangerous ratio. You've got this sort of, you know, mythical murder which occurred because, you know, the idea of root two came from when, you know, the, the Greeks were doing, you know, the two sides, one and one of an isosceles, and this number, this irrational number, which was not supposed to be spread to the masses, math is kind of sometimes dangerous. And, you know, these are the stories that we need to weave in to the topics that we want our students to learn. We come now to my favorite mathematician of all time. Uh, her story is almost like unbelievable. And if I was just to give a fact for Sophie Germain, this is one of the facts. There's, there's a, something called a Sophie Germain prime. So, you know, if P is prime, let's say three, right? Three is a prime number. You put that into two P plus one, two times three is six plus one. Oh, two P plus one is seven. Seven is also prime. So that's why uh, that's called, uh, it's called the Sophie Germain prime. So three would be a Sophie Germain prime. You know, you could try another one, five. Okay, five is prime. Put that in, two times five is 10 plus, that's 11. Oh, five is another Sophie Germain prime. You could try seven, but see what's gonna happen. You're gonna get 15, which isn't prime. So seven is not a Sophie Germain prime. That's a fact that we could share with our students. But there's also the picture of the Bastille falling in 1789 on this slide. You see, I have a funny feeling if the Bastille had not fallen and the streets did not get more dangerous because of the French Revolution, I don't think we have a Sophie Germain. Because normal times, the children, and Sophie Germain was 13 at the time, she'd be playing in the streets. The streets would be safe. But because the streets are dangerous now, because of the revolution, the fall of the Bastille, um, all the kids are kind of sheltered in. Uh, almost similar to what, what's happening today, to some degree. And you know, Sophie's a 13-year-old teenager, she's bored. So she starts sort of, you know, like just looking around and she discovers her father's library, which I think was always sort of out of bounds. But I think she went in there and then she started finding books on Latin. And, uh, you know, she taught herself Latin and Greek because she wanted to learn mathematics. But why did she want to learn mathematics? She's, 
because she came across a supposed story of Archimedes, who was so engrossed in a geometric problem in the sand that he ignored a, a warning from a soldier of Syracuse and he lost his life. Here's a 13 year old girl reading that story going, how interesting can mathematics be where you ignore your own safety? Like this is what has been documented in the story. And you could, most some of you might know the story, have read about it, but this is the first time maybe you're hearing the story. Remember that fourth slide of the voice? Think about how much difference it makes when you hear a story versus uh, reading about it. I'm not done yet. So, you know, she wants to learn math. So she gets all the teachers herself calculus and all these other kind of, you know, high level mathematics um, at night. But her father disapproves and sort of, uh, you know, starts taking her blankets and her uh, lamp away. So there's a cat and mouse game. And it's like, this is almost like a Hollywood movie. And she's teaching herself math now with a candle, blanket, it's dark. That's not the most equitable situation to be learning, yet she teaches herself math, uh, you know, uh, at the age of 18 uh, up to like high school calculus. And at that time, 1994, uh, the called Polytechnique opens up, but they don't allow women, but they allow correspondence courses. So she, she takes the name of a former student, a male named Monsieur de Blanc, and she takes correspondence courses. And there's a famous mathematician at the time, Lagrange, who is the first one to go, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff you're handing in. And he's the first one that I think she reveals her true identity to. But the person she's most admiring later on in time is this mathematician Gauss, who was just, a, I think, a year or two younger than, they're both young. And in late 1700s, his uh, uh, you know, groundbreaking book uh, on arithmetic came out. And she's all over that. And she's writing to Gauss all the time. He's not writing back. 1807 the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Gauss is in a town called Brauschwig. Sophie's concerned because the French are occupying that town that he's gonna suffer the same fate as Archimedes. So she tells a family friend who knows a general, please watch out for Gauss. This general communicates that to Gauss and Gauss is confused. Why is Sophie uh, Germain interested in my well-being? Finally, she confesses I am not who I am. And the whole story takes a dramatic turn. And he writes back this amazing letter. And forget about the part that's highlighted. Look at the, the sentence in the paragraph above, where he basically says, you must have noble courage, extraordinary talent, and superior genius. This letter should be inside every textbook to inspire not just girls, but boys as well, in terms of what is possible. And, you know, Sophie Germain did go on to be the first person that started this grand plan of trying to prove for math as, as opposed to case by case. And her personality and her humility also gave her this quote, it matters little who arrives first, right? How far can an idea go? That is the spirit of mathematics, that communal collective. That's why we're better together, if I can steal uh, the Atmos sort of slogan for this uh, 70th annual conference, which is virtual. We're better together, and that's how we learn mathematics. Uh, I told one story. There's hundreds of stories thousands of stories spanning a hundred generations. Um, this GIF uh, is courtesy of Mathagon, uh, which is a free site. And uh, you can see that all the different mathematicians in the beginning of time, I can't tell the stories and I shouldn't. I think we are all collectively responsible for finding stories and you know, bringing them, those stories into our classroom. I created this random, kind of collage. I found 18 thumbnails. I did this really quickly. But look at what happens when I put them together. You have different, uh, you have photographs and then you have sketches because obviously photography wasn't around. You have different uh, clothing, different cultures, different headdress, different 
Everything is unique and diverse. But it's not just enough for me to have pictures here. You have to say their names. So going across from left to right, you know, you have Al Charisma, you have Aryabhata, you have Bhaskara, you have my favorite mathematician, Sophie Germain, you have Agnesi, you have Evarice Galois, the end. Down the coming across the middle from left to right, you've got Jenny, uh, the late Iranian mathematician uh, Mirzakhani. Uh, you also have Shiji, Al Hafayem, Florence Nightingale, who is the mother of data visualization, Hypatia of Alexandria, Pingala, Nother, Lovelace, Easley, Brahmagupta, and Ulenbeck. And those are just a few of the mathematicians, but we have to humanize it. That was one of the words in the keynote, right? The humanization part. This is what is important, that these people were real people and they other had other interests as well besides mathematics. And the first company that actually, this is 10 years ago, a company in Canada called BuzzMath, they were the first, I think, to actually start uh, incorporating math history into a platform. And the whole idea of a collage and to make, uh, you know, these avatars with it, with the statues too. So it gives this idea that, yes, this is really important, but also make it whimsical to attract children as well. So this is a company, a shout out to BuzzMath uh, in Canada. This is, uh, usually you would uh, show a book first and then maybe show a, a pull-out quote. I go back and forth, but I, 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 I'm going to do the quote first here or the passage. And it's heavily marked up. This is my book. Uh, and right away, there's some powerful words. Justification for the book. That's a powerful word. That's a word I think we use to uh, describe a lot of the stuff we're doing in equity. We're justifying it. And that first sentence, and it, interest in history marks us for life. It gets tattooed to us. It does, if it's told in a way of compelling narrative of story. And if you keep reading on, you can see how stories come from all different places. And the one place where it's thirsting, it's hungry for more is mathematics. And where's this book from? It's from the uh, Crest of the Peacock. Um, I have all three editions. And the quote at the bottom is actually toward the end of the book. And this is why math history is important. This is why weaving it into uh, equity, diversity, inclusion is important. Because every single society, doesn't matter if they were the Agda people, hunter-gatherer people, um, whatever mathematics a society did was for their purposes. And I know when historical uh, math history books are written in the 50s and 60s, a lot of sort of disparaging remarks are made about early mathematics is crude. That mathematics served the purpose of the people. Even if it was just counting pebbles or, you know, making notches on a bone to count the cycles in terms of phases of a moon, like the Ashango bone or the Labombo bone, which is still under investigation, which has 35,000 BC, that's how old it is, both bones discovered in Africa. Every society and hence every member of society needs to be part of the global mathematical experience. So all roads lead to, and I found this image, yes, in all roads actually do lead to Rome. So in mathematics, I think all roads lead to humanization. And that's storytelling, that's belonging, that's curiosity. And I'll just up the, you know, up the ante a bit. Um, it's humanity or bust now. It's humanity or bust. Uh, if you're gonna look at the most macro ideas, the more ho most holistic ideas, the most accessible, equitable, whatever you want to say, keep filling the blank. It's all about humanity. And that's, it is or bust, but it is the widest, most accessible road that we uh, should and can be on. This slide may seem out of place. It's a great quote. It may seem out of place. It's a, it could be a bit jarring. Uh, it's a quote from my uh, good friend, uh, Peter Taylor, Queen's University, up here in Kingston, Canada. Uh, just three hours uh, east of me where I live. Alienation occurs before difficulty in learning mathematics. Now, why did I put that quote in and why this slide? Because in the slide 
uh, two slides previous, there was a word belonging. Belonging and alienation are opposite each other. Alienation is the precursor to math anxiety. This is where we spend a lot of time on math anxiety. We should be spending more time on alienation because that will eventually metastasize into anxiety. And at that time, it gets really hard to deal with some of the mathematical trauma. So that means we have to address belonging. Do our students belong in our classrooms? Does every single, of course the answer is yes, but we have to do the work to make sure they feel that. And as we've been talking about history, you know, it, for me, the, I can take the bread comes back to my history teacher, Mr. Scott, my favorite teacher. He's actually the school's favorite teacher. And if you just drop down, you see this sort of headline of our article by Junaid Mabin. He's a, a friend in Oxford, England. Uh, we're uh, co-editors at QED, uh, which is a, a site for uh, uh, sort of disruptive math blogs. QED is like kind of inside code, uh, question every dogma. And he says right there, mathematical history is soulless. Cuts right to the chase. It, you can teach it. But if you teach it without history, then there is something so less about it. And I can't think of a more soulful example than this picture, a screenshot, screen grab at the 40 minute mark of a video I found of the late uh, John Horton Conway, who unfortunately died of COVID-19 uh, earlier this year, back in March. And you can't find this image, but you can see he's about to cry. He's at the University of Toronto uh, a couple years back, and he's talking about serial numbers, numbers he discovered while playing the game of Go, which he never got good at, but he discovered this, this, these, these numbers called serial numbers, and they're just, I, I can't even understand what they mean. I've tried. But at the 40 minute mark, he digresses because the serial numbers have to do with infinity. And he talks about one of his favorite mathematicians, Cantor, who is the father of infinity. And he shares a piece of information about Cantor that I didn't even know that Cantor was responsible for starting like uh, back in 1896, like the first uh, International Math Congress. And he's saying the first International Math Congress, the French weren't, were maybe not gonna show up. And he's starting to well up. I don't know why he's welling up and why this story hit him. But he's, he's telling the story and he's, he feels sad that the French weren't gonna show up. They eventually do show up led by uh, the French mathematician, uh, Poincaré. And you know, he starts to clap like this. And his, the tears are definitely coming. And he tells the audience that as he goes into another story, cause he's been talking about serial numbers, he says, I frankly find these stories more interesting than the mathematics. The greatest, one of the greatest mathematicians of our time, person who gave us the game of life and so much more is saying that the stories of mathematics are more important than the mathematics themselves. So it's again, the emotion part that comes out. And remember that slide, uh, Maya Angelou, you know, the untold? Here's a perfect example of the told. And we know the impact that this had on, and we actually we won't know the impact on students, black female students, 10, 15, 20 years from now, who are going to be the great mathematicians in the future because of seeing this movie or hearing about this story. That's what the power of stories do. But if we want to have the broadest, widest discussion of equity, then we must have a rear view mirror. We must look at the history of mathematics. Again, if you want to have the widest discussion, it's great to talk about social justice and all the current events. 
But when I say the widest lens possible, and I'm being very specific now with Africa, you know, if you look at that fabric map on the uh, right-hand side, you can see there's fractal components threaded throughout the continent of all the different countries, even though they're separated by borders and have different other maybe customs, but there's something very specific indigenous about fractals to Africa. And look at the picture of that Ethiopian cross, that's 500 years old. And look at that picture of a fractal antenna, which was only discovered in the early 90s, a little bit by fluke. If it wasn't for the idea of fractals, um, every cell phone and every cell phone would have antennas six feet long and it would look like a Swiss army knife. And <laughs> no one's gonna walk around with that. But look at that image of the Ethiopian cross and the fractal. I mean, let's tell the whole story about mathematics. We don't even tell the story about fractals. If we're gonna tell the story about fractals, we need to tell, we need to tell the story about Africa. And that's a great book there, uh, African uh, uh, Fractals uh, by Ronnie Glash. Uh, I know some of you probably have that book. Um, so besides the Crest of Peacock, highly recommend. I definitely recommend uh, this by Dr. Ronnie Glash. He's got a great TED talk too on his uh, almost serendipitous discovery because he was on a Fulbright scholarship and he was just like flying over Africa and he noticed fractal designs in the village, the construction of villages. So I definitely encourage you to read, uh, get that book and even just watch the TED talk. Uh, and speaking of movies, uh, this is probably my second favorite mathematician, Ramanujan. Uh, and uh, this is another uh, movie which many of you might have seen. However, um, there isn't and wasn't really an accessible book about Ramanujan up until recently. And that book, and before I get to that book, I, there's this quote um, which is related to Ramanujan because he was kind of uh, disparaged by the British of his methods. Like, you're sloppy, where's the proof? Uh, he was giving all his work to a deity uh, and that God was basically channeling all these ideas. And he was made to feel bad about that. Or it wasn't taken as seriously. And well, then we have this, uh, you know, uh, actor, uh, David Crummels, who played Charlie Epps on that show Numbers, who failed Algebra 2, Algebra 1. And he's basically saying what uh, Ramanujan said. There is a spirituality to mathematics that few people understand. He saw a glimpse of that light, and he's not a mathematician, but when we have someone who want to talk about growth mindset, he failed high school mathematics, and he is at the apex, the summit of how to see mathematics. So when I was talking about, there's no accessible book about Ramanujan, and books are portals into other ideas. This book just came out this year by Amy Alsnauer. Um, it's a children's book. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. It's been long listed for a uh, uh, award. I think one of the sponsors is Subaru uh, for a science uh, picture book, uh, one of eight uh, finalists. And I love this idea of unlocking, right? It's not a story just onto itself. You know, the boy who dreamed infinity. And these are some of the things that she says can come out of discussions when we have storytelling in our classrooms. And some of you elementary teachers who are probably so well versed at storytelling with your natural inflections and cadence and rhythm, you have this amazing quality which we need to have more of. And look at some of the things which can come out. You know, um, what is, you, you can have these discussions with your students. What is like new words for a math person? I love this thing. It's like a dream catcher, maybe. Is that something which normally would have come out if we didn't have introduced storytelling? Mistake maker. You know, Ramajan said, you know, my best friend was, you know, my elbow right up there. Are you a genius? But my elbow, because he kept erasing his slate, right? There's so much whimsy, there's so much connection. And, you know, the idea of connecting to past generations, telling those stories, because if they don't get told, they die and then we forget who we are and why we're here. So I haven't shown you what an example looks like where storytelling works. 
because this is an emergent theme. So one of the things that I do at Amplify is that I help curate and bake in the storytelling. But we have to go through these four pillars. First, you have to ground whatever unit you're going to talk about, topic, in a very compelling storyline for students, for all students. And the discussions we have back and forth to make sure it's equitable is some of the toughest conversations, right? To make sure that the narrative is equitable. And if the problems have to be situated in a relevant context, uh, interesting, that's important. Give students time now. There's a quote that I, uh, uh, that's used in math recess quite a bit, you know, students need time for wondering and space for wandering. So if you're gonna make those connections, give students space and time to have it uh, marinate with their own personalities and ideas about math. They need that time and space. And at the end of the day, you always wanna keep that door open you're always sparking everyone's curiosity in the room, regardless of their background, regardless of their history, regardless of anything. It's so intrinsic storytelling that it can pull this kind of stuff out. So here's like what it could look like if you tell, uh, you connect the units to history. You know, this is what it looks like visually. This is what it looks like with the titles. Now there is that sort of seamless organic connection. You know, when is zero more than nothing? You know, we do factoring all the time, but this, you pose that question and it kind of intrigues students. You know, when is zero more than nothing? You know, zero can be very powerful. And then you can, of course, give uh, space and time to talk about Brahma Gupta as well. It doesn't have to be math history too, as long as it's a compelling narrative. Now, if you look at each one of these kind of openers for subunits, I'm not sure if you know 100% what unit's being uh, talked about. And that was done on purpose. Like, of course you would see it, but the whole idea is, okay, did the radio kill the aviation star? What is that related to? Like thinking of how a student would interact and be engaged and excited by something and then uh, related to an application of what that unit is. Again, uh, uh, in a uh, words and narrative, which suit all students. And uh, uh, we at Amplify, we uh, create these uh, math history cards. Uh, and you know, this, is, this is the belief that, co that compelling math stories, like that's an orange, that's the highlight. That's like taking the orange highlighter. That, that is so important in when we uh, curate and create uh, our uh, topics and our uh, platform. So that's really it, right? How do we lure students into the layer of mathematics as I do some alliteration? Uh, it's lore, right? And I use the, uh, you know, I guess uh, some of my favorite moments have been around the campfire two in the morning, telling stories with our friends. You know, some stories sometimes stretched, uh, exaggerated and such, but you know, uh, the math stories, there's so much richness there. And, you know, that's how one way we can lure students in is by telling stories. So how are we gonna get there? <laughs> well, we gotta build something new. Gotta build something new, as Buckminster Fuller said. And this is kind of tied into building something new. We have to walk away from the old. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to read this quote. We are in a pandemic, a global pandemic we have to start walking through it lighter emotionally and even just um, literally in terms of what we are gonna carry through. So yes, we're gonna build a new model, but we're not gonna carry old infrastructure. 
And, you know, I, I have to, I'm a Canadian, so I have to bring in some Neil Peart, you know, the song Closer to the Heart, what are we gonna build? Well, we're gonna, the reality we're gonna build is closer to the heart, right? That's the most important thing as educators, our, our greatest asset is our heart, is our empathy, uh, the ability to hopefully change. So what I've done is I've created this sort of a pinwheel model at the end here. And this has everything which I think tells us why the power of storytelling um, is important. Is important now, is important for our future. And you can just go, you know, clockwise, you know, the wider lens of examining equity and diversity. You, know, you can definitely include social justice in there too. Uh, the sparking of curiosity and wonder, you know, that's what mathematics is. It is. It's full of awe and wonder. Why don't we teach it that way? That's not my quote. That's my friend Peter Taylor, who I shared his quote about alienation about 15, 20 minutes ago. To reframe the definition of mathematician, that's also part of equity. Foster cooperation problem solving. That's that human stickiness that we're missing right now when we meet together, when we learn together. We're sitting at the same table. We're scribbling away at a problem. We're sliding uh, pieces of paper to each other. We're laughing, right? That's the same um, sort of uh, effusive energy we need um, because of storytelling to work collaboratively. Uh, there's deeper pedagogy and embedded SEL, right? The social emotional learning, the deeper pedagogy, like I mentioned with Brahma Gupta and so many other topics because it's historical, it's a thematic development of mathematics. You can't, this is how math, his, this is, math history is what it is. It's about slow failure. That's, you know, that's kind of this tragic joke. It's almost Shakespearean. Math history about failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. And what do we do in the schools? What do we do in our classrooms? We try to be successful as fast as possible. It's not human. Stronger student identity, mitigating alienation, and then richer content with historical context. And I can't let you get away with another Neil Pert because remember the whole, this whole thing is storytelling. You know, the journey of rehumanizing mathematics for all. It almost feels like a waiting for Godot, Samuel Beckett's uh, sort of play. You know, you're never gonna get there. It's just important to be on the road. It's wide open, it's fast. We're all gonna be at different places. Enjoy the ride. I debated starting this uh, keynote with this slide, my first slide. It's actually my last slide. Our discussions start here. They don't end at anti-racism, they begin at anti-racism. And yes, there's going to be some bruising, tough conversations. It's not going to be an easy path. It's not going to be easy to get to that summit and beyond because the journey never ends. The only thing I can say, and I use a Helen Keller quote, you know, life is an, an adventure or nothing at all. You know, it's a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. We are the ones have to take the risk. We are the ones who have to bring this anti-racist math education right now, starting now, have the discussions and then move forward. So thank you all so much for your generosity, for your attention. Uh, it's something which I am more aware of in terms of how important it is to give one's attention to someone else. So thank you so much and uh, have yourself a great evening. Thank you so much, Sunil, that was amazing. That was amazing. It's hard not to be in a room where you could hear the praise, but it's right there in the chat window if you wanna take a look. <laughs> um, does, does, if you don't mind, Sunil, taking a few questions? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, there's so much for me to think about. I have none. I just want to rewatch it in some ways. Is, does anyone have questions out there? I don't see any in chat. I might have missed it. Um, all right. Fabulous. There's so much. This is exactly, I think, what a lot of um, us needed. So I, I know I needed it.
thank you for your message and everything you do. Keep up the good message that you're doing. If I could just say one thing, because I know that Trina is in the room. And um, so I did mention the book by Amy Alsnauer, uh, The Boy Dream of Infinity. She contacted me about two months ago about like, like let's maybe have a conference about stories <laughs> and bridging children's literature and uh, stories with math and math education. Um, anyways, just to fast forward this, uh, just to tease it out, um, it looks like uh, it might have some uh, a place at the NCTM annual in Atlanta 2021 as an emergent theme, as a kind of a coming out uh, uh, party for it. So uh, look out for 2021, some really uh, big ideas and wonderful ideas and collaborations about storytelling. So if you're interested and you have a story to tell um, and you want to maybe want to uh, get involved or learn more, you can contact me, of course, at, uh, at Math Garden, or you can email me as well. And uh, I'd love to give you more information as that sort of all develops. Excellent. Thank you for the heads up. That's a great reveal. We have many <laughs> good storytellers in our audience as well. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you all for coming. Um, oh, Sunil, the, what is your email address? Do you, I'll throw it in their chat. Is it the Math Garden one? I could probably find uh, the, it. The Math Garden one is a Twitter one. The one that you can uh, put my email, it's a right angle math, all one word, right angle math at gmail.com. I think that's the one I reached you at, so that's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions before um, Sydney steps away? Steps away. All right. This is, uh, this is Ellen. Can you hear me? Hi, Ellen. Hi, how are you? I'm so happy to have uh, you know, found you on Twitter and started following you. And this talk was amazing. I don't know about the group, but it also felt very emotional. Um, it was nice not to learn some new activity or technology or some such thing. This was a wonderful Friday start to the evening. Uh, I just want to thank you so much uh, for sharing your stories. And I just, I just found myself very emotional listening to you talk and thinking back to my own stories of how I fell in love with mathematics, how I struggled, um, and then how I rose from that. So just thank you so much. And I hope we see you again. Um, I invite you to Albany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really, this was so awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing that. Because right in that the, you know, 60 seconds you spoke, I'm imagining your story and, and how much there is, uh, how much texture and color there is. And I think of stories, and if you think of everything, all the slides, everything I shared, there's all these tentacles, they're connected, they kind of have their life of their own. Um, you know, it, it's it's almost like the Crest of the Peacock, that book that I mentioned, you know, the all the beautiful colors up there. And I think it's, stories are the most accessible things that we have. And I, especially for elementary teachers who might feel like they always have to be the, the learner going to conferences, and they're very enthusiastic about learning more. But I want to maybe have them encourage them to, you can lead here. You have some expertise in storytelling and empathy and having those rich human connections when students are first starting their schooling, especially in mathematics. So I just think this is so accessible and I'm so glad that it resonated with you and uh, hopefully others as well. And, uh, and definitely, definitely uh, we'll be continuing these discussions, uh, not just for the rest of 2020, for 2021 and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. All Jean. right. Gene? Yes. Oh, let me introduce you the president. Um, Ellen is our incoming president of APNIS, and Jamar is our current president of APNIS. So, Jamar, go ahead. Hi, Sunil. I just, I just wanted to, uh, again, say thank you for all that you've presented. And uh, much of it reminded me of uh, uh, one of my favorite math textbooks that doesn't see much uh, light. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Harold Jacobs' uh, work. No. He had a, well, he had a textbook. I guess it's quite many some years ago. Okay. It, was, it was titled Mathematics, a Human Endeavor. And okay. he really attempted to humanize mathematics. And I just really appreciated how you were doing the exact same kinds of things. 
Well, I, I'm, 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 I, I definitely now have to get my hands on that book. And I mean, this humanization part has been, it's been there kind of in the sort of, not the underground, but you know, there's been obviously, you know, this uh, person Jacobs has obviously written, you know, an amazing textbook, which has left an impact on you. And I just think a lot of these ideas have been dormant. And I think a confluence of events, um, you know, the global pandemic, racial strife, unrest, as negative as, as these events are, you know, as a physics teacher, um, you know, for every action, there's an equal but re uh, opposite reaction. But we are in the opposite reaction phase now. We're the inflection point, whatever kind of metaphor you want to use, physics or calculus. And I think the time is coming now, like for the reemergence, the rehumanization of mathematics. So, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I also, I also had this. I was, I was going to share. Just I thought you would appreciate this. <laughs> that is perfect. That is oh, that is like name that tune in like <laughs> two notes. Well done, well done. Thank you. Close <laughs> to the heart. All right. Uh, don't worry, guys. The the great uh, messages and chat will be saved as well as the entire presentation, and it will be posted on our YouTube channel and website. All right. Thank you again. I'm going to shut down the meeting. Have a good night and a great weekend. Thanks again, Sunil. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.